Shalom, shalom. We are back. So on typical is back with so typical part three. Part three of merchandise of Yasharel. Uh, I've been enjoying it. What about you? Uh, oof, it's been a ride, <laughs> um, but it's been definitely uh, enjoyable presenting this information and putting it out there for the family just to have in your mind uh, the things that the enemy had planned for us and what the Most High even had planned for his people uh, due to our lack of obedience. Right. And also just how the uh, nations responded to that. So it's been it's been um, enjoyable um, being able to share this information. It seems like uh, ever since we started, everything has been against us. But, you know, I'm, I'm thankful that the Most High used us on this platform to get that information out. Mm -hmm. uh, people have been um, enjoying it, so I'm thankful for it. It wasn't in vain, so that you know that's my yes. only. But I yes, totally. we're back with part three. So, so we want to just do a little quick recap. We left off on a to be continued, um, where we were talking about the CIA coming in, dropping drugs in the community, right? And then we left off with Nixon and the war on drugs. Right, right. So we're going to pick back up at that same spot and we're going to talk about just a little bit about uh, the racial profiling and harsher sentencing that happened as a result of the war on drugs. This led to more of Yashirel in prisons and longer uh, periods of time as opposed to other races in the prison system. So we're going to go over an article by the Addiction Center and it reads, Nixon criminalized drugs like marijuana, which many believe brought harmful stereotypes to the hippie or anti-war left population. Additionally, Nixon's harsh punishment for drugs like heroin and crack cocaine crippled the black community in the 70s and created stereotypes and harsh jail sentences for black people. Criminalizing drugs like heroin and crack cocaine was not just created to penalize black Americans as an overdose from these drugs can be fatal. Nixon believed drug use, especially when done by the youth, was a social rebellion, negatively impacting and weakening America. Some believe Nixon had an underlying motives for his campaigns, including targeting black people and the anti-war left. John Eckerman called the Watergate conspirator spoke out about Nixon alleged race and anti-war left discrimination. Alrighty family. So as we can see that there was definitely a, a agenda as with all the yeah, as always we discussed agenda. and went over with part one all the way to part two going into now there's always been an agenda to either um, eliminate or to make use of uh, right. Yashirel. Mm -hmm. And this was no different. The war on drugs was really a war on our people. Um, the drugs were initially dropped in our communities and those drugs were used basically against us. Um, we had people being addicted to those drugs. They started getting um, violent. We had people that were selling drugs. They started getting violent. And so now you have gang violence picking up in the um, in our communities. You have gun violence yeah. starting to pick up in our communities. And then now you have high crime rates in our communities. I mean, you know, you look at it and uh, black on black crime has been just running rampant since drugs began to be uh, established in the black community. Uh, we destroy each other for drugs, for drug money. Mm -hmm. It has been a, a chaotic, uh, demonic attack on our people because it seems like it's never going in. I mean, as much money they throw into it, it just year it after year, it just continues to go. For us, and this is just on a personal note, we have a back end, we were originally from Texas and the city where we're from, gang violence is so prevalent we had i mean many many teenagers we had a few um i want to say up to 10 teenagers die from gun violence in a matter of a year 
just in the small city where yeah, we're, we're from. Yeah. So it's been it's continued to um, be prevalent drugs, gang violence, and um, gun violence in our communities. It, it just we don't see an end to it anytime soon. Um, so unfortunately, uh, they took this the violence and the high crimes and all these things, and they decided, hmm, how we're gonna make money off of this. The secret meeting that changed rap music and destroyed a generation. Damn. So look, so he says, between late, between the late 80s and early 90s, I was what you may call a decision maker with one of the more established companies in the music industry and had the means to influence them any way it wanted. Right. This may explain why in early 1991, I was invited to attend a closed door meeting with a small group of business was business insiders to discuss rap music's new direction. The meeting was held at a private residence on the outskirts of Los Angeles. I remember about 25 to 30 people were, were, were being there, right. most of them familiar faces. Our casual chatter was interrupted when we were asked to sign the confidentiality agreement preventing us from publicly discussing the information presented during the meeting. So now it's going to get to the good part because the meeting about to start. Talk to him, Jake. <clears throat> One of the industry colleagues who shall remain nameless like everybody else, he briefly praised all of us for the success we had achieved in our industries and congratulated us for being selected as a part uh, as part of this small group of decision makers. At this point, I began to feel slightly uncomfortable and the strangeness of this gathering. The subject quickly changed as the speaker went on to tell us that the respective companies we represented had invested in a very profitable industry which could become even more rewarding with our active involvement. Damn. He explained that the companies we worked for had invested millions into, millions into the building of privately owned prisons and that our positions of influence in the music industry would actually impact the profitability of these investments. Sure enough, someone asked this Someone asked what these prisons were and what any of this had to do with music. <clears throat> we were told that these prisons were built by privately owned companies who received funding from the government based on the number of inmates. Mm -hmm. The more inmates, the more the government would pay these prisons. Mm -hmm. It was also made clear to us that since these prisons are privately owned, as they become publicly traded, we'd be able to buy shares. Most of us were taken back by this. Again, a couple of people asked what this had to do with us. At this point, my industry colleague who had first opened the meeting took the floor again and answered our questions. He told us that since our employees had become solid investors in this prison business, it was now in their interest to make sure that these prisons remain filled. Our job would be to help make this happen by making music which promote criminal behavior mm. rap being the music of choice mm. now they find a way for industries to profit off of black on black crime through avenues such as the entertainment industry so as you can see the people that were in charge of um, these new industries and building these industries that were marketed off of crime were adamant about using the the gun violence the gang violence yes. and all these things mm -hmm. that were in the community that were ripping and tearing our communities apart they wanted to market those things and help promote it and, and get it out there more so that more people were involved in it right. so that they could fund whatever endeavors yeah they mm -hmm. had going on yeah and, and continually have people going into prison systems those private prison systems as was mentioned in the video were literally placed there to make profits. They make millions and millions of dollars off of those prison uh, systems. You're so. looking at billions and trillion dollar yeah. industries that some of the top uh, endeavors for uh, Americans is pharmaceutical, entertainment, and uh, prisons. Yes. You know, I mean, those three industries fund everything that's going on in the world. Yeah especially in America right now. So right. Um, so we, by marketing those crimes, like we said to Yasharil, 
of Yashiro, they were able to make billions through the music industry, um, through, I mean, countless albums through the gangster rap phase and the, um, going forward, they were able to market those. And then we had the movie industry that decided to tap in. And so you had movies like Boys in the Hood and Minister Society, and New, and, Jack City uh, and New Jack City, and, yes, yeah. that promoted all kind of crime and drugs and all this stuff within the communities. And so they were able even now to profit off of those things uh, through the uh, movie industry. I remember for a while in the 90s, oh my gosh, you couldn't go see a black movie without there being violence yeah. and crime and drugs and all of the stereotypical things that they had uh, helped build up within our own community. Community, I mean, you don't really look at how bad it was until you look at our young generation and how uh, their mentality is now because of uh, a lot of the movies that were on uh, in that era of, uh, you know, or even our people of our age now that were in that era. Uh, how they portray black families, black yes, men. How men treated the women. Yeah, how men treated the women. How uh, kids got treated. The men was never at home. I mean, this was a society built upon a film and yeah. literally put out there and they played it. And, and made it cool. Yep. They like, hey, look, killing each other is cool. Like, you actually get cool points from doing this. You actually right. get cool points from making money from selling drugs to your own people. You actually get cool points from going back and uh, retaliating and getting somebody that killed your own family member. Right. I mean, when I was in school, I mean, you you know, they, they'll call you a square in a minute if you had a family. Like, if, yeah. you, had <laughs> if, you, if you had a mom and a dad at home, you were considered a, a square. square. You know, it, like, they called you Oreo because you had an actual family. Uh, with insane. both parents in the house, <laughs> like that's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. So I mean, everyone's story was a broken family. Yeah. I came from nothing up, you know, and that's in, in hip hop to this day. That's kind of the money maker foundation. They sign artists with this familiar background. It's like if you really have a family, then they go make them portray somebody they're not just to go sell these records. Yes, absolutely. So now we transition from the uh, marketing of the movie and uh, uh, music industries into sports. We have now where they go and they say, oh, let's take you know some young talented black kids from the ghetto, from the ghetto. and let's put them in boxing, let's Ooh. put them in football, let's put them in basketball, and we're gonna build a billion dollar industry mm. off of that, off of yeah. that. I don't know what Nike, Jordan, uh, Adidas, all these brands would be without black athletes. Yes. Um, they have propelled themselves up uh, off of the backs of uh, black men and women. You know, I, uh, Jordan's first contract, me and my wife was talking about it, was like 500000 He got two Mercedes Benz and something else I can't remember, but they netted over a hundred million off of off of that first contract. So he got a small little pinch. So you have a hundred and fifty-one uh, sport franchises and only one uh, black, black owner, and that and, yeah, and that black owner is Michael Jordan. Even he doesn't own a stake in Jordan Brand. I mean, that's it's crazy. Crazy to think about how much Jordan Brand has made Nike and he doesn't even own a stake in Jordan brand. Yeah, we have an industry that's, that fully profits off of primarily, um, especially the basketball industry um, and the uh, the basketball franchise and the football, yeah, football franchise. Football, NFL, that's yeah. That's highly... Um, uh, Endorsed. Uh, Yashirel is right. mostly black people. Yeah. And they're... There's only one out of all these franchises, there's only one black owner. It's ridiculous to even consider. 
but they make millions off of that and that's just one aspect of this the sports part and then you have also the contract part and then you also have just the entertainment part where you have um merchandise and uh things like that that yeah. are being sold so, through those same industries black lives matter is where well. <clears throat> black lives matters was one of those things where you had our people having something that was near and dear to us something that was uh focused on our communities that was played in our communities yet again something that was heartbreaking for us something that we were crying out about that we right. needed some change for and they managed to even take that and manipulate and profit from that. And I say there's, you know, aspects of Black Lives Matter that I agree and disagree with. But yes, if you look at uh, what was going on during that time, you've seen a plethora of sport team putting on the, the, the merchandise of Black Lives Matter. And you've seen few and far between what they were perpetuating in the media saying that they wanted to help people in a whole understand what was going on in the cities and in the, in the communities. But in the background, you seen Black uh, Lives Matter headbands, Black Lives Matter t-shirts, Black Lives Matter courts. I mean, they were getting a lot of money off of Black Lives Matter, which is, I mean, I can't even estimate how much they made off of just uh, hashtag Black Lives Matter. It was everywhere. Yes. The merchandise for it, and you have a who is buying it primarily? Us, of course, because <laughs> right, we're we're right. we're we've attached ourselves to something that wasn't even initially started by our people. But that's another topic. Um, we we attached ourselves to that um, Black Lives Matters movement, and we were connected to it. When we see merchandise coming out, and we see our sports teams out here, and they're wearing on their jer uh, jerseys you know um a fist or you yeah. know something with uh, Trayvon Martin it, yeah. on it you know we were attached and we because we're emotional people so we attached ourselves to that and we let them uh, make fools of us yet again by purchasing and buying into this um to this nonsense it was just nonsense and i mean we could have literally created our own merchandise our mm. own people could have created our own we could have went to the mall everybody got a mall by them to create t-shirts you could have went and printed your own black lives matters t-shirts for your own self and it didn't have to be black lives matter something that was near to you you were in stores buying people's merchandise that were even from our own nation of people i mean it's it's caucasians right, and yeah. other races of people making these shirts and we will go and buy their merchandise and i mean yeah because you look our at own cause. when the nba wanted to protest the players themselves are the one that had to go to the league and tell the owners that they didn't want to play because the owners themselves wanted the NBA players, they wanted the league to continue. So it just goes to show you that they didn't have intention of, of supporting right, the, the actual movement. movement. Yeah, it, it, it was insane. So the players had to stop playing and it just goes to show you that they really don't care what's going on. Yeah. If you wanna if you wanna talk about real support and you wanna talk about really having somebody's back, put your money where your mouth is. If you wanted to really support that movement and really, really, truly seek out justice where there was so much injustice, then you would have been backing your players um, and shutting down things for a while right. and, and making a stand with them. But instead, of course, they proved that they're they're only worried about their pocketbooks and what we could do for them. All the time. So. As we transition, we'll uh, touch on this last topic, and this is about our culture. Yes. Um, this is one of the topics. It's a little touchy. It's a little, you know, but it's an area it's that... It's real. Yeah, it's real. And um, other nations have profited right. from our culture. That's it's, it's just a factual thing. Unfortunately, we lost who we were as a people. Um, for many years because of captivity and because of the things that we went through in history, we lost who we were. And um, we've managed to find a sense of self 
and create little nuanced things mm. that, that make our culture its own unique thing, well, well put. especially in America. Right. Uh, Black Americans, uh, Yasharel that lives in America, we've created our own culture. I love our people and I love our culture. You know, every, every culture has uh, their own, well, like my wife said, nuances who makes them who they are, you know? And I feel like when we get that, that opportunity, it stole away from us. So now all our influences and who we are to, that makes us unique is everywhere. Yeah, it's everywhere. I mean, like now you can't, you cannot watch a movie, you can't watch, listen to music, you can't um, look at somebody, how they dress. You can't look at, I mean, there's every, and I'm talking about amongst every race on this planet, there are people that are mimicking behind the black culture, one way or the other. So you have our influence spreading around and you have people that can't stand us. They can't, sometimes they can't even stand to be in the same room with us. And sometimes they just don't. They're they're amazed because they don't even see us that often enough right, to be right. to hate us one way or the other. But they're still intrigued enough to still want to take away from pieces of that culture. So, um, and this is kind of a little side thing, but it's something that always personally bothered me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is um, like uh, our women, we've always been built a certain way. Okay. Um, all the way from the continent, all the way to America, all the way to Jamaica, wherever we are, we always been built a certain way. And you didn't, it, it, didn't, it literally took a Hispanic lady to come and make a big butt popular <laughs> and to market that uh, you and talking, blow up off right, of it. Right, right, right. Okay, y'all know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. And then now you have people that with the big lips and the big butt that mm -hmm. you have another race that's being presented and marketed for the thing that we've always naturally had. Yeah, right. So it's so strange to me and it really bothers me as a black woman. It is, it's, it's annoying. <laughs> so uh, that's just one aspect that I just kind of wanted. Just this kind of gets under your skin. Yeah, it gets under my I skin. I mean, being, being a black woman in today's society, I, I can understand you guys' frustration because everything that you guys saw beautiful as far as your your hair they came in and said oh no afros in the workforce mm -hmm. you got to perm your hair make it straight mm -hmm. and then they said oh okay we're gonna make where white is beautiful my daughter thinks that she is a white person i know that i'm white mom claims her daughter's a racist i'm not fat which is an african-american thing against her own race being black is so gross and ugly you are saying disgusting things god made one perfect person it's me does it occur to you that you might be hurting people's feelings? African Americans don't have feelings because they're not people. All new Dr. Phil. people take issue with my beliefs. I'm white. I'm a Caucasian because everything about me is different from an African American. I have naturally straight hair. My hair isn't nappy. It doesn't require weave. My nose is not giant. It's like African Americans. My lips are perfect. They're not too big and they're not too small. They're just perfect. My ears, I don't have black people ears because they're really giant. Most African Americans speak ghetto. But when it comes to black people, I think they're all ugly and I have nothing in common with them. I'm different from African Americans because I'm white. My figure is just like Kim Kardashian and she's a wonderful role model. I act and I think like a white person instead of a black person. I believe that I'm completely and um, utterly better than them. Like we're on two different levels. Like, okay, African Americans are here. I'm here. White people act and think just way more mature than African Americans. Black people, they think in a criminal way. When I think about African Americans, I feel like asking them, what is wrong with them? They're really dangerous. If an African American is on the same street as I am, I'll cross the street to avoid their chaotic, thuggish way. You know, Are when you, okay? you see this as a black man and as a black woman in our society because they have perpetuated that white is beautiful, when we are the human, then, mm -hmm. then there's something mistakenly wrong, you know? Absolutely. Going forward on, there's other figures that we know that have been used, uh, such as figures like Mr. T with the gold chains, you know, he got 
threw on TV and, and uh, that end up blowing up and he was used for a, a specific time. Mr. T. You make, a, you make an impressive entrance. Before we get started, uh, you were so frightening in that motion picture. Uh, and uh, Have you acted before, or was that just you we were watching there? Well, the character calls uh, to be hungry, and I've been hungry all my life, so it wasn't a problem. That's why I wear these combat boots, because it's symbolic of my struggle. I'm born in the ghetto and raised on welfare, so that's what sort of the character was about. Yeah, you know. yeah Mr. T is a unique figure because yeah. When he came around, he I, he was from the military, and uh, he wanted to be unique. He wanted to stand out, so he put all these chains around his neck, and they literally saw they they saw him as a, a walking merchandise. Yeah. They, that's when really the 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 you know a lot of people say it came from hip hop, but it really came from he, Mr. T. Say, yeah. yeah, and he helped perpetuate that and hip hop kind of took it and yeah, piggybacked it, off right, of it. Right, right, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and so you have uh, that aspect and then you have other celebrities that are being made merchandise of even to market burgers. What's up world? Yeah you, I'm Travis Scott. This is my McDonald's order. Follow me. Here's my quarter pounder with lettuce, pickles, onions, ketchup, mustard and bacon. Yeah. Here's my fries. Sometimes I do this. Then I dip them into barbecue sauce. Oh yeah, and my Sprite. Same order since back in Houston. And you can try it too. Gotta go. The Travis Scott meal, just $6. Say Cactus Jack sent you. Like, okay, family, please. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're gonna go market something that's killing people in the world because you know the food is the most unhealthy food. And of course, it's the cheapest food, so it's targeted toward our communities People, yeah. predominantly because it's the one of the cheapest things you can go eat. And then you have people marketing burgers. Um, sad, sad. Yeah. And that's one thing I would like to, you know, see from rappers and, and entertainers um, have some self value. Yeah. Most of our people understand what has went on in the world and the killing of yeah. our people yeah. and how they have sabotaged our people. Now, why would you go market a burger with all of this yeah, stuff garbage? That you know is not good for you. When we got our people dying <laughs> like crazy from heart attacks, strokes, and and diabetes and everything else. Just so you could get a dollar, yeah. you know? I mean, sense. have some self-value. There is, there's so much that you can make money on. Have some self-value. I think when our people start to begin to have self-value, then you know we will things will start to change. Yeah, I agree. And so um, we move from that phase into people also uh, mimicking our, uh, like we mentioned, music, dance styles, the way we dress, even how we wear our hair.
Now you have another aspect of the culture that is considered or called Gen Z that is made up of basically influencers. They go um, to unknown channels. Some of these influencers go to unknown channels yeah. and still dances, slogans, and they take credit and profit off of it, off of our culture. So you have uh, several, as I mentioned, white influencers who now have the means to be able to get people to send them merchandise so that they can market merchandise and they're getting profit from that. You can negotiate uh, deals off of merchandise yes. and things of that nature from being an influencer. Yeah. Uh, a lot of influencers right now, especially on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, are making millions of dollars of just the, from their name. Yeah. Just from being an influencer mm -hmm. on society. So they will take that influence, they'll go to unknown channels of our people, of Yashiro, and they'll steal our culture to help promote themselves. Today we're gonna to talk about this viral pose. When it's done on TikTok, the pose is most often accompanied by the song Hey Loft by the band Mother Mother, and it involves someone sharing a bold piece of information about themselves. But it's such a common and widespread meme, and now even the Sharp family singers do it. What could this possibly have to do with black people? Well, this pose actually originated in basketball subculture to represent the saying ice in my veins, which is a play on the term cold-blooded, which means ruthlessly competitive or skilled at the game of basketball. It was famously popularized by the former Lakers player D'Angelo Russell, who would make the pose in celebration after scoring. But like most things on this app, the meme's roots in black culture have been widely acknowledged for the sake of associating with Gen Z more generally. Next, we're talking about the F-boy face. Follow for more. Do you know why people make this face or where it comes from? Welcome to episode 2 of How Everything on This App Originated with Black People, where we show how most of Gen Z culture is just a whitewashed version of Black American culture. So when it's done on TikTok, this face involves a user raising their eyebrows, squinting their eyes, biting their lip, and sometimes rubbing their chin. It's most often accompanied by the mashup of the songs Another One Bites a Dust and Holla Back Girl. On this app, I've seen it called the F-Boy Face, the Swag Face, or the Lip Bite Challenge. One website credits the popularity of this expression to an influencer named King Christian who did the pose in a very viral video and combined the expression with a Naruto parody and called it Swag Jutsu. His original TikTok with it had over 17 million views and he even has a tutorial on how to do it. But many black Americans don't need a tutorial because this is literally a trend I remember from middle school and it was always called the light skin pose or the light skin face as a joking way to play on stereotypes that lighter skin black men try to be like pretty boys or a little conceited. And just for the historical record, here's proof. Next, we're talking about sheeshing. Do you know what it means when people say sheesh or where it comes from? Welcome to episode 3 of How Everything in This App Was Created by Black People, where we show how most of Gen Z culture is just a whitewashed version of Black American culture. On TikTok, saying sheesh gained a lot of popularity after a video of the word repeatedly being said to a frog was posted by the user Meet Julio. The sound from the Meet Julio video and the word itself are used when people show off something they accomplished, where the high-pitched sheeshes are like an applause. Often the sound is made with the ice in my veins pose and the light skin face which I covered in my last two videos. In the 1950s, sheesh became a term in the dictionary to describe frustration, independent of any notable black influence. But the term gained its present day slang usage as a way to give extreme praise or to hype up your friends from black Americans in the 2000s and 2010. It was a part of a larger movement known as drip culture, which was mostly driven by athletes and rappers. For example, Young Thug was using the word this way in 2015, and LeBron James was using it in 2017. Here's some additional info. Follow for more. Do you know where the hope challenge comes from or what it means? Welcome to episode 4 of How Everything on This App Originated with Black People, where we show how most of Gen Z culture is just a whitewashed version of Black American culture. On TikTok, people use the song Hopeful in a meme where they explain something that happens in the future that ironically contradicts what they were expecting or hoping to happen. For example, someone might say they're going to finish their homework and then freeze frame to explain that it never got done. But if you didn't know, this is the second wave of how the song slash meme was used on TikTok. Originally, it was done to mimic the ending of black movies, and one of the earliest versions was created by DKTV. Very specifically, the song Hopeful is known for its use at the end of Coach Carter, a movie about an academically underperforming basketball team starring Samuel L. Jackson. The Where Are They Now movie ending montage is an old trope, but it was popularized in the black American community through movies like Remember the Titans and Cooley High, which ended with a freeze frame of the main characters and gave life updates. Next, we're talking about simping. Follow for more. Are you a simp? Do you know what simp means? Do you know where it comes from? 
Welcome to episode 3 of How Everything in This App Originated with Black People, where we show how most of Gen Z culture is just a whitewashed version of Black American culture. The term simp gained a lot of mainstream usage on TikTok a little over a year ago, when many male users like Polo Boy would lean into a trend of describing some time they did something nice for a woman in a relationship and then welcome themselves into Simp Nation. It later gained a less problematic popularity as users of all genders started describing themselves simping for anyone they strongly admired or respected, including fictional characters and celebrities. But did you know the term simp has been used in the black American community for decades now? It can be traced back to rap music from the 1980s, and one example includes when it was used in a 1992 song about a guy who has a crush but doesn't know how to make it known. This is the lyric. In an interview with Too Short, one of the rappers who popularized the word in 1985, he defined the noun as the opposite of pimp and said that it's meant to degrade the person you're aiming it at. Comment what I should explore next. So why are black people, African Americans in particular, so protective of our culture and trends? It's honestly very simple. When we don't protect our culture, someone or something else takes credit for it, makes a profit, and or erases the black people slash communities who originated the ideas. This concept goes back to the early 1900s, but we also see a version of it in real time. When Addison Rae went on Jimmy Fallon did those dances mostly created by black people, I hope you realize she probably got paid tens of thousands of dollars. It took nearly a week of campaign for the original creators to even be mentioned on the show. When SNL did that cringy Gen Z hospital skit, which had Elon Musk and other comedians appropriate AAVE and slang, it went viral and probably increased their viewership by the thousand. When King Christian sells t-shirts with a light skin face and calls it swag jutsu, and Josh Morris builds a whole account off the same thing and calls it sexy face, I'm sure they're profiting from the millions of followers they got from just rebranding something black people have been doing for years. When Charlie D'Amelio did the Renegade dance, her career skyrocketed, but I guarantee you Jaliah Harmon won't be getting any brand deals with Dunkin Donuts. The day that black creators get the same amount of clout, recognition, and payment that white creators do from using our trends is the day we'll stop being so protective. So you see from the video, new ways of reinvention. Uh, merchandise of men has kind of been the totality of what the nations have done. Um, it's an ongoing story of our, our transition as a people, but understanding we're still in the works. But I know the Most High will bless us and give us our, the heritage that He knows He gave to His people. That's facts. And so, we want to just conclude this uh, video off with what is the totality of this? What is the conclusion for our people? And what is the hope for our people? What do we have to look forward to? So we're going to read a scripture, uh, Isaiah 24 and 16 through 20. From the uttermost parts of the earth have we heard songs, even glory to the righteous. But I said, my leanness, my leanness, woe unto me. The treacherous dealers have dealt treacherously, yea. The treacherous dealers have dealt very treacherously. Fear in the pit and the snare are upon thee, O inhabitant of the earth. And it shall come to pass that he who fleeth from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit. And he that cometh up out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in a snare. For the windows from high are open, and the foundations of the earth do shake. The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall be removed like a cottage. And the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it and it shall fall and not rise again. Hallelujah. So I hope you guys have enjoyed Merchandise of Man. We pray this series was a uh, blessing to you all and we uh, we just ask that you guys continue just to seek seek out the knowledge that has been poured out in this hour the most I said in these days in these last days knowledge will increase Preach. it's a perfect opportunity for us to go back and look and I mean it's so readily available the things that used to be cut off from us um, now it's just a click away to go back and look at our history and look at the things that have an impact on us and who we are even as a people. So um, we just pray that it encourages somebody to go back and, and, and maybe lights a little fire and some of you um, that want to go back and look at this and even for uh, other nations uh, outside of Yasharil to um, understand and know that the Most High has promised that He will bless those who bless us. He will look out for those who um, look out for us. So even if you have it in your heart to um, be able to hear a word and to to understand what has been done to the Most High's people in, 
that maybe it'll prick you enough to um to turn back and say okay i see this and i'm going to be a part of uh of the change moving forward so well we thank you all for listening and um we appreciate you for tuning in until next time so on typical